in a second. Oh, there we go. Brilliant. All right. So thank you very much again, Robin, for, for agreeing to come and chat to us and do take the floor over to you. Oh, well, thank you so much for that amazing introduction, Eleanor. Um, yeah, I feel like so me and Eleanor know each other pretty well. We are. We go back a long way and Eleanor gives fantastic introductions wherever I go. But this is perhaps the most, <laughs> the strongest of introductions she's ever given me. So I will do my best to try and live up to those those grand expectations she set for you. Um, <laughs> but we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm going to talk to you today all about my work with mounting gorillas. Um, so I'm really an evolutionary biologist by, uh, by trade, um, but I work for a conservation organization, which is something of an unusual match. Um, but I'm going to talk to you today all about how understanding the behavior of a species, in this case, mountain gorillas, is really fundamental for helping us to tailor their conservation strategies, right? To find the best ways of, of conserving the species and helping the population grow. So that's really what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, but as an evolutionary biologist, oh, if I can get the slides to change, see how that goes. There we go. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't not start with an evolutionary tree. Um, so as you're probably all aware, we are Homo sapiens, and our closest relatives are the chimpanzees and the gorillas. Um, so the chimpanzees, you've got Pantroglodytes, your kind of classic chimpanzee, and then you've got Pampaniscus, the bonobos, who are fascinating. This isn't a talk about bonobos, but if you want to learn about a really strange ape, you should definitely look them up. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about gorillas because they're my personal favorites. Um, but humans and chimpanzees split about five to six million years ago, and gorillas and split from humans and chimpanzees seven to eight million years ago. So that happened in pretty close succession in terms of evolutionary time. And that means that we share 98.8% of our DNA with chimps, but also 98.3% of our DNA with um, gorillas. So that's actually a really, really high proportion of our DNA. But in fairness, to put it in context, we, we do share something like 30% of our DNA with cabbages. So we should kind of bear that in mind. But it is a lot of our DNA. So there's a lot of a really kind of who we are as humans that we share with the other apes, our other kind of great ape relatives, as it were. Um, but great apes are really suffering in terms of kind of their populations and their conservation. And some of this, I mean, a lot of this has to do with us. So the three major threats to great apes and particularly uh, gorillas, I'll be talking to you about that today, but really to all great apes are kind of poaching habitat loss and disease. So you can see in the poaching picture here, this is my one of my colleagues at Fossey Fund taking down a snare. So these are traps that are put up in the forest and these are used mostly to catch kind of little antelopes. So these aren't people trying to target the gorillas. These are people essentially trying to get a good source of protein probably for their families and yet as a consequence of that, we kind of get gorillas caught in these traps. They can kind of get a wrist or an ankle caught and those wounds can get infected and that can kill them or they can kind of lose a limb. So it is a really big problem. Um, in other parts of the world, poaching directly for apes is also still a problem. So kind of for the zoo trade, for the pet trade, these things do still happen today, but are declining somewhat. Um, so poaching is a really big one. Habitat loss is huge, um, especially for our, our poor cousins, the orangutans, as demonstrated by this picture here. You've probably seen a lot of this sort of thing in the news. Um, the level of deforestation going on in kind of orangutan habitat is, is mind boggling. Um, but we're also seeing that for really all of the all of the great ape species that that as humans encroach in on their space, there is much less habitat for them to live and they they need a large home range. They move a long way. They feed on a whole variety of different foods. And so this is really detrimental to, to their conservation. Um, and finally, a big one is disease. And part of the problem here is that great apes are so closely related to us that they can catch many of the same diseases as us. So, for example, uh, we know that a lot of zoo gorillas actually caught COVID during the pandemic because, you know, something that can infect us can also infect them because, you know, 98.3 percent of our DNA is the same. Um, so we have kind of people encroaching on the habitat of these animals. We have more opportunities for diseases to cross over, either from from apes to humans, well, well, we're apes too, from um, from chimps to humans or gorillas to humans or vice versa, and neither of those things are good. And it's particularly particularly worrying for these kind of small endangered populations. 
Um, so this here is actually a photo of some of our collaborators at Gorilla Doctors intervening when a gorilla has got very sick. And we think that in this case, it was a, a respiratory infection um, where it got it got really, really bad. So something like a flu to us could kill a gorilla. Um, and so they're kind of intervening with some antibiotics there. Um, OK, so this is kind of the intro to what are the major threats to great apes and especially gorillas. Um, but here's an introduction of kind of what are the gorilla species. So there are two gorilla species. Um, handily, it's the Western gorilla in the west of Africa and the Eastern gorilla in the east of Africa. Um, and each of those species has two subspecies. Um, and both species are critically endangered. So the most numerous subspecies is our Western lowland gorillas. Those are the gorillas that you've probably seen in the zoo, if you've seen gorillas in the zoo. Um, there's also a tiny population of cross river gorillas. And then in the eastern gorillas, we've got eastern lowland gorillas that are also known as Grauer's gorillas. And they are the population really that's declining most rapidly right now. And we should be extremely worried about. So there were about 17,000 of them in 1995, and that population is now closer to 6,000. So it's a really rapid decline in the grouse gorillas. And it's really difficult to conserve them because they only live in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which has Ebola, it has kind of political instability, and it's just a really, really difficult population to, to conserve. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about mountain gorillas. Um, there are roughly a thousand of them left in the wild. And contrary to all other gorilla subspecies and actually all other ape populations, the mountain gorilla population is actually increasing. And this is because of a huge concerted effort from kind of governments and NGOs to protect these gorillas really beginning kind of about 50 years ago. So I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the lessons we've learned on mountain gorillas and how kind of studying them can help inform strategies potentially for other gorillas uh, subspecies too. But we also have to bear in mind that it's it's a very diff different political and kind of ecological landscape for a lot of these different gorilla populations. So it's not always kind of transferable from one population to another. Um, okay, so the mountain gorilla populations. Um, they live in two isolated forest fragments. So one in Uganda, the Windy Impenetrable National Park, which is frankly the best name of a national park I've ever heard. Um, I've yet to go, I would love to, um, but many people do in fact go inside and study the gorillas there. Um, so that's where one of the gorilla populations are. And the other gorilla population is in kind of just below this, um, in the basically the Virunga Massif. So this is an area that spans three different countries. So Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, just a tiny bit in Uganda, and in Rwanda as well. Um, so this is where kind of the larger of the two gorilla populations is. And this is the one that has been studied since the late 60s. So we actually know that this population has really been increasing pretty steadily since the 80s. Um, so it was down very low to kind of less than 300 individuals. Um, in the kind of late 60s, early 70s, and it's recovered really dramatically. So it's kind of more than doubled in the last 50 years, which is which is really um, wonderful. Uh, there were definitely points in the last 50 years where people thought, you know, this this population would go extinct before the turn of the century, but there's been a huge amount of effort to prevent that, and and it's one of one of conservation's small number of conservation success stories that we have. Um, since kind of the late 90s, we've also followed populations in the Windy um, National Park. And so you can see that most of the population growth that we've we've seen in the last 20 years is driven by this, this Virunga population. But we also are kind of seeing kind of slow but steady growth in the Windy population too, um, which is great news. And I'm going to talk to you today about the Karasoki study population. So this is in that Virunga population of gorillas. Um, and it's in this little corner um, kind of to the south in Rwanda. And so researchers here have been working since the late 60s. So this, the Karasoki Research Center was set up by Diane Fossey back in the 60s. And this population has been consistently monitored ever since, which means it's an incredible resource for helping us understand gorilla behavior, gorilla evolution, gorilla conservation, all of those things. So we have data on more than 400 different gorillas um, living in this area. And this includes things on kind of patterns of dispersal between the group, when individuals are born, when they die, who's related to who, 
what kind of what all the social interactions are like and who's the dominant male, all of those things. Um, so I'm really lucky to get to work with more than 55 years of data on this, which is which is really kind of a researcher's dream and definitely was my dream when I when I started working for Fossey Fund. Um, so the goal of the talk today, um, I'm going to talk you through really kind of Gorilla Sociality 101. What is the social life of a gorilla like? What is kind of the day-to-day -day life of being a gorilla? And then I'm going to talk you through really three projects I've been working on in the last few years, looking at how this kind of social behavior shapes our conservation strategies and kind of what guides the, the, the goals for the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, what we want to campaign for, what we want to help um, the government put in place. Um, so I'll be looking at kind of how understanding their behavior informs our understanding of disease transmission, of kind of patterns of inbreeding, and also kind of the effects of this increasing gorilla population within this small region of habitat. Um, so first, the social lives of gorillas. Um, the first place to begin here is with these family groups. So this, these social units really are the, are the core of what it is to kind of socialize as a gorilla. Um, and in most gorilla subspecies, the predominant kind of social group are these one male family groups. So you can see this silverback male, he's the one with kind of the red the red crest um, he's, and the silverback. Um, so actually, fun fact, I don't know if it's fun. Um, people think that maybe it's only some male gorillas that get to become silverbacks. All male gorillas become silverbacks once they reach adolescence. So it's not kind of a sign of dominance. It's just a sign that, you know, they're male. It's how male gorillas develop. Um, but the larger they are, kind of the bigger the crest, the more silvery the back tends to be kind of an indicator that they are kind of going to be more successful, going to be more dominant um, in the, the interactions between males. So this is a one, one male family group. And what happens is that individuals are born within these groups and they grow up. And if they are female, when they reach sexual maturity, they leave the group. And what they'll do is they'll immediately go off and find another family group to join. So this is kind of an unrelated male, they find a group, and then they can have their own offspring within that group. And females don't really ever travel alone, they tend to move directly from one group to another. So often when groups encounter each other, that will happen. Um, whereas males, when they leave, they tend to become solitary. So they have to head out on their own. They can't be accepted into another group. They have to try and form a group of their own. So they are kind of moving around, trying to attract females to form a group of their own. And in some cases, we also get bachelor groups. So this is when a lot of these young males kind of group together. Maybe they're not ready to break out alone. They want a little bit of social support from their buddies. Um, but these tend to be quite temporary. And eventually, some of these males will manage to form groups um, and kind of have a family themselves. So this is kind of the basics of how groups form in kind of guerrilla society. But mountain gorillas are a little bit different. So they do all of that. <laughs> But there's a slight twist, which is that really only about half of males and females end up leaving their group at sexual maturity. So a lot of them actually just stay in the group they were born in. Um, and this means that these groups kind of grow and grow and we'll get multiple males living in the same group. So this is kind of the original male and then males that grew up within that group. And maybe the, the kind of the original founding male might die and these younger males can take over. Um, so these groups can get quite large and the largest we've ever seen was 65 individuals and these groups are kind of moving and feeding together so that's a lot of individuals to kind of negotiate with and, and make decisions with um so eventually they tend to fission so this is where the group will break into two or sometimes three different groups um particularly if there are young males coming up who are quite quite dominant quite strong and females will choose kind of which male am I do I want to follow which which male do I want to form a group with and then those those groups will split apart and they'll just travel independently sometimes they'll bump into each other um, but from from once they've kind of fully split from each other then they're then they're pretty separate so what is life in this these kind of family groups like? So these, as I said before, can be single adult male or multiple adult male groups. It's multiple adult females, or at least at least one, and then all of their offspring. Um, and these groups range from two to, as I said before, 65 is the largest we've ever seen, but that was super rare. Um, 
So normally they're around kind of 10 to 20 individuals and they're going to be moving around together. They eat together. They build a nest in a new site every night and they'll they'll kind of nest within kind of a couple of meters of each other all together. And then they wake up together in the morning and move off. So they're very cohesive social units. All right. So this is a video which hopefully you can see OK. It's really just a snapshot of gorilla social life. So you can see the male up at the top. He seems to be kind of scouting out the other side of the stream, checking out what's going on there. There's a there's a silverback here just playing with one of the kids. I think that's a juvenile. I'd say probably about three or four years old. So they're just kind of playing around. There's uh, some grooming going on above them. Uh, maybe a female and a young a younger gorilla, probably about three. And then there seems to be quite a contemplative female up at the top. Maybe maybe she's eating. Maybe she's napping. This tends to be the state of a of a gorilla group. They are very chill. They're mostly napping or sleeping. Sometimes they're playing. Um, so this tends to be kind of day to day what they're up to. Oh, yeah, just some more playing. <laughs> um, so they're pretty calm. They're not kind of necessarily the crazy aggressive animals that the people people tend to build them up as sometimes. Um, so they're pretty peaceful. Um, but what what we also know is that gorillas are sharing their space with each other. So their home ranges overlap with each other. And so there might be other neighboring gorilla groups nearby or solitary males all using the same space. And so when groups meet each other, this tends to be when there might be some some aggression, when you might see more of that kind of aggressive side of gorillas. Um, but so that's only about one in three. So in a third of cases, it can become kind of physically aggressive, but also sometimes they are very friendly. So it's about one in five of these encounters are quite friendly. What I mean by that is it's still a little bit tense because, you know, the males are still kind of trying to figure out who's the dominant one and seeing if some of the females might change group. But the groups will kind of intermingle. They might feed. The, the young ones might play together and it's a little bit calmer. Um, and what we find is actually that groups that have split from each other in the past. So when they've kind of done these fissions, when they later come back into contact with each other during these encounters, they tend to be much more friendly. So they're much more likely to be friendly. And we actually found that this was, was still true 10 years later. So we looked at whether this kind of friendliness declined over time, and we didn't find any evidence of that, even in groups that had split kind of 10, 11, 12 years previously. So they seem to have these kind of long-term, long-distance relationships with other gorilla groups, which is quite fun. Um, so this here is actually a video of a intergroup encounter. So this is Musili Kali group and the Sousa group. Um, I would keep an eye on this guy in the middle, this this uh, silverback male that's eating rather dramatically. Um, but this is a fairly tolerant interaction. This is just about on the friendly side. You can see they're intermingling, but it is a little bit tense. Um, they're all kind of watching this male in the middle. And there he goes. So he's done a chest beat. He's sort of using the food as something of a, a dramatic display. And you can see that this other silverback male who's, who's from the other group is sort of turning away and giving him a little bit of space. Um, I would say gorillas are quite a passive aggressive species, if that is <laughs> a, a fair scientific description of them. Um, they, they really only rarely resort to physical violence. It's mostly like, oh, I yawned. Look how big my teeth are, but that's nothing to do with you. It's like, it's quite subtle, but also hilariously not subtle at the same time. Um, so this is what it's like living as a gorilla, socializing as a gorilla. So this is your little insight into to the social lives of gorillas and their day-to-day -day, um, group interactions. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about how understanding this behavior, these social interactions, helps us conserve them, helps inform our conservation. I'm going to start off with disease. So this was one of the three main problems that gorillas are facing. Um, and so understanding patterns of disease transmission are really important to helping us kind of decide how best to, to help conserve them. Um, and social interactions, as we're all probably quite aware at this point, represent opportunities for diseases to transmit. So understanding patterns of social interaction can help us understand and potentially predict how diseases will transmit in the future. And so 
one thing I do is I use social networks um, to visualize and analyze social structure. So here we've got like each of those circles represents an individual and the lines between them represent um, kind of potentially a social interaction. Um, and so we can use this and use our knowledge of animal social structure to then guide conservation strategies. So here is kind of a more simplistic cartoon of a of a gorilla social network. Um, and as I said before, these nodes, or they were circles before, and now they're little gorillas, these rep represent individuals. So in this case, individual gorillas in a group. And these connections are known as edges. They represent kind of maybe the amount of grooming. Or if we're interested in disease transmission, they can represent um, something like proximity. So if I'm interested in maybe a respiratory disease that spreads by kind of coughing and sneezing in close proximity, maybe air droplets, Something like proximity is really informative for understanding disease transmission. And so what we know in general from other kind of animal social networks is that individuals that have more social contacts are more likely to be exposed to disease and then to spread that disease to others. So these are kind of our high risk individuals. Um, and our social networks can help us model disease risk that is faced by different individuals and understand kind of how quickly disease uh, can spread, whether there's certain individuals that we should kind of target for vaccinations, it can inform all of that. Um, and in the mountain gorilla study population that I work with, we've actually had 15 different respiratory outbreaks in the last kind of 16 years or so. Um, and these are really problematic. We have had a few de deaths from respiratory outbreaks. Um, and so understanding this transmission pattern is really important for us. Um, so we've classified outbreaks as when more than a quarter of the group is showing symptoms. So these are things like coughing, sneezing, having a runny nose, all of that we've used um, through daily observations to kind of figure out who is potentially sick. Um, and then what I've done is I've built social networks based on patterns of proximity between all of these individuals in kind of the, the months before and after um, the outbreak to understand whether this can inform us about how diseases are transmitting. Um, so these are each a social network of a different group during a, an outbreak. Um, so males are squares, females are circles. The red ones are the ones that showed symptoms of an infection. Um, and they're different sizes based on their age. So what we found kind of analyzing these social networks is that unlike really most other uh, species in which this has been studied in, what we're finding is that infected individuals aren't actually more closely connected than other group members. So if I'm sick and the 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 person that I spend most time with in my gorilla group isn't necessarily more likely to be sick, which is pretty strange. It doesn't follow much logic. Um, and we're also finding that the individuals that are most connected in their group, so kind of have the most are most often in close proximity to others, aren't more likely to show symptoms. But when we look at these um, networks, what we can see is that really basically everyone is getting sick. Um, and this is really the, our kind of overwhelming finding is that just the majority of group members are getting sick. So they're spending a lot of time in close proximity and maybe it doesn't matter if I spend, you know, 95% of my time next to this person compared to 90% of my time next to this other person. You know, we're really, I'm going to expose all of them to whatever diseases I have. Um, and so what we find is that within these groups, gorillas are so closely connected that all group members are really quickly exposed to infection. So this on, on the uh, right is a pretty dramatic example of it from uh, Pablo group in 2010. You can see that by day three, the whole group is infected. And so if we're thinking about ways that we can prevent this rapid disease transmission, Really, by the time an individual is infected, it's too late to prevent that that transmission to the rest of the group. They are, you know, they're building nests in close proximity to each other every night. They're doing everything together. And so it suggests that we're really going to struggle to find a way to prevent that transmission within these groups. Um, this is a slightly less dramatic example of what we see. Um, but you can still see that, you know, pretty quickly, most uh, most individuals are sick. And if they're not sick, it's probably not because they weren't exposed. It's maybe more to do with kind of their immune response and what's going on there and whether they've maybe had this recently in the past. Um, so what we find across these different um, 
outbreaks is that we're getting really rapid disease transmission going on within these guerrilla groups. So the kind of mean, the me, sorry, the median um, R number is about four. So this is kind of how many gorillas does one infected gorilla go on to infect before before they um, recover. Um, and so you can see if, if one gorilla is infecting four others and there's, you know, maybe only 10, 20 individuals in the group, very quickly the whole group is, is exposed. Um, so we know that really transmission within these groups is just incredibly rapid. But what about transmission between groups? So this is actually really important. Maybe one gorilla group gets sick and that's that's really bad. But if we're getting rapid transmission across a whole population, that's much, much more of a conservation risk. So we also wanted to look at kind of whether these these um, outbreaks are transmitting between groups, too. And the kind of the two most um, uh, the the clearest ways in which this could happen is during these intergroup encounters, like the clip I showed you before, and also when females transfer directly between groups. So we looked at how often this occurred during outbreaks, and we've got encounters happen in slightly more than a quarter of outbreaks. So that's quite high rates. Um, and we've got transfer events occurring in about a fifth of, of these um, outbreaks. So that these do happen, and it is a feasible way in which disease can transmit between groups. But actually, when we look into the timings of these outbreaks in different groups, we can't find any cases where an outbreak in the group that an individual transferred to or that the group encountered then subsequently became infected. So we haven't actually found any evidence of them transferring um, these diseases, transmitting these diseases between different groups. But one thing we know is that our understanding of, of guerrilla group encounters is a little bit limited, right? We know if they encounter another group when we're there, but we have researchers in those groups for up to four hours a day. So it could happen when we're not there. Um, another possibility is that it could occur through the environment. So maybe they are feeding on a delicious bamboo shoot in one group and then they leave and another group comes in and maybe an individual could could get infected that way. So we looked at home range overlap. So basically how much of the home range of one group overlaps with the home range of another group and does it predict if they have outbreaks in close succession or not? Um, and what we find here is that it doesn't. Um, so actually in terms of their direction, um, groups that are infected have more overlap with uninfected groups than they do with those that are infected at the same time as them. So we really have no evidence here that transmission is occurring between these neighboring groups, which is great news um, in terms of kind of understanding how these these kind of respiratory infections could spread through the population. But it does raise a really important question, which is if it's not if they're not spreading it to each other, where are these diseases coming from? Um, so what are our conservation implications from this? Well, we know that we're getting really rapid and also quite unpredictable transmission within groups. Everyone is essentially infected. Um, and by the time you know that there's an outbreak going on, it's kind of too late to deal with it. And so in terms of how we should spend our kind of conservation time and budget, trying to prevent transmission within a group is something of a lost cause. And so we need to, to prevent those those infections arriving in those groups to begin with. Um, but we've got no evidence that they are being spread from other groups. So where are they coming from? And this is where we have to look to other research and other studies where they've kind of run the genetics on, on these infections is what they found is that these are caused primarily by human pathogens. And so what this suggests is that these repeated introductions that we're seeing are potentially coming from humans rather than from other gorillas. And this is really important for us to know because we now absolutely need to make sure that we are limiting any possible transmission between human, human researchers. We are people that visit these gorillas every day. There are also tourist groups visiting these gorillas every day, and there are anti-poaching teams near the gorillas all the time. So now we know this, we have to be incredibly careful. Um, so it's all about kind of making sure that minimum distance rules are kind of understood and enforced, that individuals are wearing masks when they go anywhere near the gorillas. And this is what kind of our research can help us um, help guide us in, in our conservation plans. So that is disease. Um, next, <laughs> on this whistle-stop tour of gorilla conservation, we have uh, inbreeding. So 
as you might have spotted before. Um, these, these mountain gorillas live in these quite small and quite isolated populations. So there's actually no dispersal between the Bwindi and the Virunga mountain gorilla populations. Um, and there's about 600 gorillas in the Virungas and about 400 in Bwindi. So they're pretty small populations. What you also might have picked up on before is that in the mountain gorillas, actually only half of individuals are leaving their natal groups, which means that we end up with a lot of quite highly related individuals in the same group. So not only do we have potentially quite low genetic diversity to begin with because of these kind of small populations that were historically even smaller, um, but also the gorillas aren't really helping us because they're not dispersing from their groups. So we're not getting great gene flow between different groups. So that could potentially be a problem. Um, and what we see is that, so this here is a graph of the, the proportion of individuals that are still in their natal group um, by age. And we see that actually it's pretty high with males. Females kind of can keep uh, dispersing across their lives. And so we do see this kind of really uh, drifting down over time. But by the time a female first reproduces, only about half of them have left their group. And the same is true for males. And so the likelihood of them, the, them reproducing with a close relative is pretty high. So what we wanted to do is to understand kind of, are there any behaviors that the gorillas are using to kind of limit this, this potential for inbreeding? Um, how are they choosing who they mate with? Are they potentially avoiding mating with their kin? Um, and so when we look at group composition, what we find is that in these multi-male groups, um, there's a 48% chance that an opposite sex group member of reproduction age is a close relative. So almost half of the, the, the gorillas they could potentially mate with are actually their relatives. Um, this is less of an issue in single male groups because it's essentially one male that then attracts females that tend to be unrelated. So we're not so worried about the single male groups, but the multi-male groups are a potential problem. Um, but when we look at who they actually choose to copulate with, we've only got a quarter of copulations occurring between um, close kin. And this results in, again, about a quarter of offspring having related parents. So gorillas do seem to be avoiding um, mating with their kin, at least to some extent. Um, but what we can see is that paternal siblings really represent the majority of copulations and reproduction between kin. So they seem to be struggling to identify who their paternal kin are. Um, if we look at the stats on this, what we see is that mother, son and father, daughter pairs are less likely to mate in a given year. So do they mate or do they not? They're less likely to mate um, than those that aren't kin. Um, but we don't see this for maternal or paternal siblings. So um maternal kin are still mating in terms of, of, of siblings but when we look at how often they actually mate with each other we see that maternal siblings basically they do mate but they mate at a much lower frequency than unrelated group members um but paternal siblings don't so what this suggests is that they're really struggling to identify who their paternal siblings are this makes a lot of sense because they can tell who their mothers are essentially by familiarity. They spend a lot of time in very, very close kind of proximity and contact with their mother as they're growing up. But they also spend a lot of time in close contact with their siblings who are kind of their maternal siblings because their maternal siblings are doing the same. So they're all in very close proximity to their mother. So they've got a good idea of who their mother is and who their maternal siblings are. What they don't know is who their paternal, paternal siblings or father are because there are multi, multiple males in this group. And what we find when we look at females mating patterns is that they are mating with multiple males in the lead up to um, kind of conception. They're mating with multiple uh, males throughout their pregnancy. And so really nobody knows who the, who the father of these offspring are. Um, so this raises an interesting question of kind of, if they can't tell who their paternal kin are, how are they identifying who their fathers are? Because they seem to be avoiding mating with their fathers. Um, and what we find here is that there's quite an interesting interaction going on between male age and female age on whether a pair will mate. And what's been suggested in the past is that maybe females just avoid mating with anyone that is old enough to potentially be their father. And so we looked at this in more detail and we looked at it separately in females that had dispersed from their natal group and females that were still in their natal group. 
And what we find in dispersed females is that there's no interaction at all. So essentially what this graph shows is we've got male age here on the x-axis, and then these different colored lines are based on female age. So the youngest females are in red and they're mating the most, but they mate more with males the older they are. And we see the same in kind of intermediate aged females and in the oldest females. They let mate less, but they are still kind of increasing their, their likelihood of mating with a male based on how old that male is. When we look at females in their natal groups, what we see is something very different going on. So young females, these ones in red here, are avoiding mating with males the older they are. So they're less likely to mate with them if they're older. And we don't see the same patterns in kind of intermediate and um, the oldest females. In fact, the oldest females are really, really choosing to mate with kind of older males and intermediate aged females. This effect is a little bit less strong. So this really suggests that there's this kind of age based avoidance of males that are old enough to be their fathers. And it's quite interesting that this is only done by females in their natal groups. Um, so it's quite flexible. It's a flexible strategy that they kind of can do when they're in their natal groups and then kind of once they dispersed and it's not a problem, they know that this male isn't necessarily is very unlikely to be their father, then they don't have to avoid mating with him. Um, so it's quite a clever strategy that's being used in the in the mountain gorillas to avoid mating with their fathers. What are the conservation implications of this other than kind of me just spending months digging into all of the mating patterns of the gorillas? Um, well, we know that this historically very small and very isolated population could lead to problems of inbreeding. And the dispersal patterns could really exacerbate this because it results in a high proportion of close skin residing in the same group. But what we know now is that gorillas can effectively identify and avoid mating with their maternal kin. And they probably do this using familiarity. So it's the, the kin that they grew up in, in close proximity to. Um, but females are also quite effectively avoiding mating with their fathers using this age-based mechanism. So the only major problem here is that there's, there's still mating with paternal siblings going on. And in the grand scheme of how related individuals are, it's much less bad to mate with your paternal sibling than it is your father. It's still obviously not ideal. And so we need to kind of get a better genetic understanding of what level of kind of genetic diversity we are working with in the mountain gorillas. So I think there's a really strong argument for kind of more widespread genetic analysis of what's going on here, but we don't see any signs of inbreeding depression in terms of kind of high mortality or unusual um, uh, diseases or kind of uh, different problems that the gorillas might have. We don't really see any evidence of that yet. So potentially good news here in that they seem to be avoiding most of the inbreeding that could happen, um, but we need the genetics to really confirm that. So finally, I'm going to talk to you about density. Um, so we know from before I showed you this graph that the number of mountain gorillas in this, this small habitat is has more than doubled in the last 50 years. And at the same time, that habitat has also decreased in size. So there's less habitat than there was before. And when we look at population growth patterns in the study population in the Karasoki gorillas, what we can see is that pop, uh, the population growth was really increasing right up till the end of the 1990s. But the rate of growth has subsequently declined. Um, it is still well above zero. Well, it's still just about above zero. Um, but so, so the population is still growing, but the rate at which it's growing has really slowed. And so we want to understand why this is. Um, and a major clue to that is this graph here. So what you can see in red is the density of gorillas in general. So in the number of gorillas in an amount of space. Um, and what we can see here is that this individual gorilla density hasn't increased despite this, this population growth because the gorillas are able to spread out across a larger area. And so this has happened kind of gradually over time as there's more gorillas, they're spreading out a little bit more. But what we see in black, what's plotted here is group density. So this is the number of groups in a given area. And so what we what's happened is that there were a series of group fissions from kind of 2006 onward meant that we have now three times as many groups as we did before. 
And this is quite an interesting natural experiment to help us understand what the consequences of kind of dramatically increasing group density are. Um, and this is something we've been studying in the last kind of four or five years to understand what are the consequences of this change in density. So we know that there were three times as many groups afterwards, and this led to three times as many intergroup encounters. When we compare this low group density period, which I've shown in blue, with this high group density period, which I've shown in yellow. So what is the result of this kind of increase in intergroup encounters? Well, we see the rates of infanticide go up almost five times. So infanticide is very common in gorillas. It's not males within the same group, but it's males from rival groups. So when we get a kind of a violent intergroup encounter, it tends to be the males are involved in the fighting, but in infants can get kind of caught up in this. And so they might kind of, a male might run and grab an infant and kind of do a dramatic display in which they kind of chuck the infant to the ground. And, and that's how a lot of infants die. And so what we've seen when there's much higher group density, more of these violent encounters, and we're seeing a really major increase in infanticide. So, so the likelihood of, of a gorilla infant surviving has decreased quite a bit. Um, we also see that male mortality has increased. So this is, again, during these intergroup violent encounters, they do sometimes kill each other. Um, it's very rare, but given this kind of major increase in the number of um, intergroup encounters, we've also seen this increase in male mortality. Um, and finally, something that you might not expect to have such a big impact on population growth is that there's been an increase in female transfer. This is actually 10 times as many female transfers going on now. Um, so this is when females move between one group and another. Uh, you might think, why would that impact population growth? Well, what we found is that if if females change groups, this has a major effect on their reproduction. So what we find is that it normally takes a female about kind of four years to have their next offspring. So from one offspring that survives to the next one is about four years. If their groups fission, it's still roughly about four years. But if they transfer between groups, they've basically got to build a whole new set of social relationships. It's it's pretty um, detrimental to their, their general kind of levels of reproduction and kind of there's a lot going on, a lot of new things to learn. And so what we find is that this is delaying their reproduction by seven and a half months. But if they're transferring multiple times, which is actually very common now with this really high density group situation, this is delaying their reproduction by a year and a half, which is pretty major. Um, and so in combination, we've got these higher rates of female transfer, which slows their reproduction. And we've also got lower rates of survival in these infants. So what this means is that it's taking females more than two years longer to produce an offspring that survives infancy during this high density, uh, high group density period. So this seems to be what's really slowing the, um, the growth rate um, in particular, because females just can't have as many offspring as they could in the past. So what are the conservation implications of this? Well, we know luckily now gorilla groups have managed to shift their home ranges slightly to reduce this overlap. So you can see that a little bit on the left. These are the kind of home ranges of the groups that we monitor over time. And you can see that particularly by 2018, they've really spread out quite a bit. Um, so now these rates of intergroup encounter are beginning to decrease. And we've got quite early signs that the rate of population growth is no longer slowing. So it might be beginning to recover, which is great. But they don't have more space than they did before. So we are lucky that there were, there were regions of gorilla habitat that weren't really being used. But as the population grows, these, these regions that aren't used won't necessarily exist anymore. You know, as, as we have more and more gorillas in this space, they will lose the possibility of kind of spreading out more and reducing this overlap. And so, at that point, this kind of increased rates of mortality, the slower reproduction is likely to become the norm. And so what this really highlights is that it's important to protect these remaining habitats, make sure that it doesn't decrease any more than it has already. And also that it's really important to try and work on expanding these protected areas. And this is something that I'm working in my current role with Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, and they are working a lot with the Rwandan government to kind of in talks about how to potentially expand this habitat and what would be most useful for the gorillas. And obviously it's a much wider 
social problem as well of kind of you might have to move people in order to make space for gorillas. Um, so that's something that's kind of really needs a lot of debate and discussion. But it, it does show that really from from the gorillas perspective, it is important to make sure that they have enough space because these these intergroup dynamics are potentially really detrimental to their um, their population growth. And obviously they can't grow forever. At some point they'll have to reach a, a point where, you know, there there's a level of hab there's a number of gorillas that are sustainable in the habitat. But we're currently at these really low population sizes of like 600 gorillas. So even kind of an in increase of maybe another 100 gorillas is really valuable in terms of kind of helping their conservation and making them kind of a viable population in the long term. OK, so this is my whirlwind tour of all the ways that uh, behavior helps inform conservation in the mountain gorillas. Um, I've talked you through how disease trans how behavior helps us understand disease transmission the levels of genetic diversity in the population, and also how these, these social behaviors can influence population growth. And hopefully overall, I've given you an understanding of, of, of why knowing about a species behavior is really important for helping us tailor their conservation strategies and helping us really focus on those strategies that are likely to be most effective for them. Um, okay. Thank you so much for listening. I need to say a really big thank you to the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund team. So most of this data is not collected by me. Most of it happened long before I even started. Um, and there's a huge number of people that help collect all of this data and none of this research would be possible without them. Um, and I also have to thank my, my wonderful co-authors on the projects I've, I've spoken to you about today. Uh, so thank you very much for listening and I'm very happy to, to answer any of your questions you might have about gorillas. Brilliant. Well, first of all, Robert, thank you so much for, for, for coming to chat. That was utterly, utterly fascinating. It's wonderful to hear all about your research. You are amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, does anybody have any questions? Anybody got any questions? I'll have a look in the chat. You can write in the chat or you can. Um, oh, uh, there's one from Isabel. Are any other animals being considered sources of disease except for humans? For example, bats. Ooh. Um, that is... I do think it's it's something we do worry about, particularly in terms of Ebola. Um, so currently there is an Ebola outbreak going on in Uganda. Um, and Ebola has is probably the disease that's had the most catastrophic effect on any great apes. Um, and so we know that, well, people believe that uh, bats are kind of a major transmitter of Ebola. And so in terms of that, it is a concern. But we have much more power to prevent humans getting too close to gorillas than we do to prevent bats getting too close to gorillas. Um, kind of, we know that that gorillas are exposed to humans every single day, and so that's kind of our priority in terms of preventing at least respiratory infections, um, because it is the same the same diseases that that humans and um, and gorillas are catching. But yes, there are definitely other other species that can transmit. Diseases and Ebola is a big one. So where I actually did my PhD was one of the places where Western lowland gorillas had a major outbreak of, of Ebola. And I mean, my supervisor would would talk to me about how kind of they'd go into the forest and just everything would be dead. So you'd have kind of antelopes and monkeys and gorillas and and you just walk everywhere you turned. There were kind of dead animals. Sorry, this is a really grim, um, <laughs> grim topic. Um, but yes, so we absolutely we can't rule out that other species are, are transmitting, especially especially diseases like Ebola. Um, it really depends on kind of who can catch it. But I think especially COVID as well. Actually, we know that a lot of a lot of primates and mammals in general are susceptible to COVID. Um, so that could be a problem, too. But humans are the animals that gorillas are most exposed to, at least in this kind of these habituated populations. Can I add another question quickly onto that one then? Of course. Thanks, Robin. Have you managed <laughs> to isolate any pathogens from gorillas that are suffering from outbreaks? So do you know if it's a viral respiratory infection or bacteria based? Just uh, so I haven't personally. I know that there are papers in the past that have done that. We've got maybe I think one or two where they have confirmed that it is, yeah, a kind of a human respiratory infection. I can't remember. <laughs> I feel like maybe there was a rhinovirus. I've forgotten the exact um wouldn't surprise me one. if it was rhino. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. That's uh, that's Isabel, who's our, our, our lumpy skin disease expert at the <laughs> at Rizzle. Um, and uh, so we've got a question from from John. Uh, how are transferring females received by the males slash females in the new group? Does this have an effect on their reprodu re reduced reproduction? Thank you. Shall I read that Wait, again? I think I read yes, that please. Quickly. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I thought, oh, it would be good if you could see my face rather than the screen. And then uh, I got distracted by the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how are transferring females received by the males and females in the oh. new group? Does this have an effect on their reduced reproduction? That is a really good question, potentially. Um, so what we find is it's the males are pretty happy to have a new female in the group. Um, the, the females are less happy to have a new female in the group. Um, this is my, my scientific evaluation. Um, but there is, there's kind of some theorizing and some kind of suggestions that females could kind of be particularly aggressive to new females when they come in. And this might prevent them um, either becoming pregnant or kind of carrying a pregnancy to term because of this kind of hostile environment essentially that they're moving into and it does take a female quite a long time to really kind of integrate into a group um it's actually something i'm wanting to look at in the next few years to really understand this process of integrating in a, into a group whether it's you know whether it's easier if maybe your your sister is already there or whether it's kind of individuals that you know a little bit already um but yes i think it is is a very very kind of high likelihood that that these relationships might be preventing females getting pregnant. Um, we can't actually rule out that, so some of it might be that kind of females before, basically that females choose to change group because they haven't been getting pregnant. So it might be kind of related to, it might be kind of correlation rather than causation in that sense. Um, so it's something we need to dig into a little bit more. Thank you. Um, and um, just a quick follow up to that. What's uh, is there any information? I don't think you implied some there on why they're choosing to leave an existing group. Are, are they being uh, being pushed out? If uh, obviously it's something must be overcoming that negative um, experience that they're going to receive, and you know the 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 whole novelty, the whole movement between the groups is. It, it, that's quite a challenge, I would have thought. So, but but they're still making a change. Is, is that a is that something overt, or is this something sort of deeply within their psychology that they they want to leave the nest type thing? Yeah. So, brilliant question again. Um, what we what we know is that females tend to leave a group if the male is quite old, if the male is sick. Um, or if a male has recently died. So essentially, females are really, really dependent on the dominant males of their group for protecting their offspring, for kind of pro protecting their infants and preventing infanticide. And so essentially, a female can't change group until her infant is weaned at around three years old. And at that point, they have a decision to make where they, they're deciding, do I reproduce with this male, stay in this group, and take the gamble that he'll be here in three for the next three years to protect this offspring, or do I change groups and find this this other male that maybe I just I recently met in this intergroup encounter and he's got a big group and he's got a lot of females so maybe he's a better bet. Um, and so that's kind of the decision that they're making um, about whether to, whether to transfer or not. And sometimes it's not so much of a decision as kind of a a necessary thing. So if the male, in particularly in a one male group, if that male dies, the whole group disintegrates. So we don't really ever see females in a group without males. Sometimes they might move together to a different group. Um, and so in those cases, those females don't really have a choice. They, they have to find a new group and they'll take on that kind of that reproductive delay because it's better than trying to reproduce on their own and having that 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 infant almost definitely die. Um, Forgive me for more, but um, since this uh, increased with the increase in the intergroup, um, you know, the, 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 the interactions that they had, yeah. does the nature of that intergroup interaction, has that been investigated 
in this context. I mean, you know, if you see a, a more successful gang, if you see your another male displace your male, is that having an effect on this decision making, or or is that being investigated particularly? Mm. You've got those two those two encounters. I mean, th th there's evidence there for uh, somebody to make an informed decision. Then, uh, to, you know, I, I was wondering if that had anything to do with it. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I don't think people have really looked into that in in that level of detail, like in terms of what happens in the in the encounter prior to kind of whether females move or don't move. I think that would be really interesting. Um, I think we need some really detailed behavioral data on it. And I'm not sure it's the the data we have already is up to those levels, but it would be really interesting to understand, yeah, like what what yeah, what happens for a female to go, oh okay, this this male is worth the cost of of changing groups. That's really cool. Brilliant. Well, and uh, yeah, that was that was uh, from from John, our, our resident animal behaviour expert here. Uh, we've got uh, so you've got like three three minutes left. Um, so I've got one more question uh, from uh, Samuel, who is our uh, a lecturer in wildlife here. Um, and also, we just want to double that with with one from a few of the students who I know want to ask. Um, <laughs> So, so first of all, Samuel's question is, with such restricted genetic transfer between populations, are there any translocations of individuals from one area to another to increase gene spread? And the other one that I just want to tag on separately is um, what kind of top tips in the last few minutes, what kind of top tips would you give to, there's a lot of third years and and uh, master students who are about to finish and looking in careers in conservation. So, so question about genetic transfer and then separately tips for budding conservationists. Okay, brilliant. Uh, translocation has not been tried with mountain gorillas yet. I think we haven't got a strong enough argument that that the, the genetic diversity is low enough to make that necessary, but we also lack a lot of genetic data. So I think I think it's something that would need to have a really, really strong justification before it was done. And this is because gorillas are basically constantly moving, constantly feeding, and to move a gorilla from one um, to one location to another is a really, really difficult task. I know that there are cases of um, zoo gorillas being reintroduced in on an island in, I think, in Congo or maybe Gabon, and it is it's tricky. It's a lot of them died, and a lot of them had to be kind of had their food provided for a long time because you've essentially taken them from an environment where they know where all these resources are so they're traveling kilometers every day to find all these different foods and you move them somewhere where they don't know where any of the food is um i think i mean the mountain gorillas have like super abundant food resources i think they'd probably be okay but it would be a really big gamble and i think only one worth taking on if if they reach a point where we think that kind of the level of kind of inbreeding, the low genetic diversity is a really major conservation problem. Um, so it's not been tried yet, but we might reach a point where it is. Um, yeah. My top tips, I'm trying to think. My conservation is a really hard career path. Um, that's that's probably my, my main takeaway. Um, and that you should keep trying. You know, if it's something that you're really passionate about, you got to send a lot of emails before you know you get that acceptance, and I think that's kind of a brutal part of academia and a brutal part of of conservation is that a lot of people want to do it, and so you have to apply for a lot of stuff um, before it works out. For me, um, I actually top tip: you can't just cold email people if you think that they're interested in something. If you you're really interested in something that they're interested in email them and tell them because they'll they'll love it and also there might be an opportunity for you so my first opportunity working with gorillas is I was actually at the end of my undergraduate and I I found somebody online that I thought did really interesting research and I wanted to do a PhD with them but I wanted to do field work first and so I emailed them saying you know I'm really interested in doing a PhD with you at some point what should I do first how do I get like what is the best experience that I could do and he's just sent me off to the Congo, um, which at the time my parents were like, what, you're going to the Congo? Do you know anyone there? It's just this man that you emailed from the internet. Um, so be careful. But also, um, <laughs> also like you, sometimes you've got to just take those opportunities and send those emails and ask about um, what you could do to get your kind of foot in the door. And I 
went out and studied those gorillas and I loved them so much. Just like kind of being in the forest every day, you'd get little, little sneak peeks of their behavior. And I thought, yeah, this is, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to study gorillas really kind of forever if I can. Um, and so from then, that's kind of how I got my PhD. And I just sort of kept plowing away at it. And there's also a lot of rejections that you don't hear. You see people's careers and you don't see that all of the re all of the rejections that they've also had. So I had a bit of a rough year and had nine rejections, but one um, acceptance. And it's all about the acceptances. So now I get to go on and do more guerrilla research, but it, it's it's tough. Um, and you're not, you know, if you're out there thinking, wow, I just get rejected for everything and everyone else seems to be succeeding. It's not that everyone's getting rejected from most things. Um, and that's really rough. But if you can make it work, that's wonderful. And, and that's kind of how at least I've managed to, to make it through uh, the last, what, maybe eight years of, of conservation and, um, and academia. But it is a it's a hard career path. And, you know, other career paths are out there if you want. If you find something you're passionate about that isn't that, that's wonderful, too. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Robin. I can see. Oh, there's one more, one more comment coming in the in the chat. I can see um, from Haley. Um, but I know we're just kind of wrapping up now. Let's just see what Haley says. No pressure, <laughs> Haley. <laughs> <laughs> Frantic typing. <laughs> oh, we've got some thank yous coming up. Oh. Oh. Oh, she's just going to say thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> All righty. Well, well, thank you very so much. Me. Oh, wait. I'm trying to position myself so you can see my face as I say goodbye. <laughs> the sunlight is not helping me. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, thank you so much, Robin. That was utterly brilliant. That was utterly oh, fascinating. Oh, oh. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and chat to all of us. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the, uh, the students on this call will take a lot of those things away. So thank you so much, Robin. And thank you all to you brilliant students who have come despite the uh, despite being finished and being on a holiday and all the staff managed to make wow. it through. so thank, thank you yeah thank awesome. you so much for having me and for your really brilliant questions really some really fascinating ones thank you brilliant all righty bye <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, I'll do one more. Stop the 